Mary concludes the second stroke of her hymn by lines which lead our thoughts away from God's dealings with herself to a general law of his providence. His mercy is on them that fear him unto all generations. And yet in these words, she may well be classing herself among those who fear God and whom God in consequence visits with his mercy, whatever form the visitation may take. By fear, she means that sincere and awestruck apprehension of the presence and majesty of God, which is the beginning of all spiritual wisdom, since without it the soul can take no true measure either of itself or of what is due to the author and end of its existence. Such fear may coexist with love, although love in such degree as it becomes perfect expels from fear the element of terror, while preserving that of reverent and watchful apprehension. It is in this sense that perfect love casteth out fear. Fear and love are the twin guardians of the higher life of the soul, and God never fails to help and govern those whom he brings up in his steadfast fear and love. Mary, then, shows by what took place at the Annunciation that she had this fear or reverent apprehension of God in her heart, that she was looking out for intimations of his will. And accordingly, his mercy lighted upon her. He made her the mother of his son. But the same law of his action would hold good for all coming time. Not by natural works of righteousness, which man had done, but according to his mercy, would Jesus Christ save men from their sins. And this mercy would be accorded to those who had in their hearts the sensitiveness to what was amiss in them, which some apprehension of what God is alone can give. So it was with those earliest believers who waited for the consolation of Israel. So it has been with every soul which has come in adult life out of the darkness of heathenism or unbelief to the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. To the end of time, Jesus is the channel and dispenser to the human race of the infinite mercy of God, and he dispenses it to those seekers who begin with fear. But Mary's words have another and a deeper meaning. It is that for the endless well-being of the soul, those earliest stirrings of life which are due to a divine influence and which we call fear and love are more important even than religious privileges. They are more important, not in themselves, but to us. Without fear and love, the greatest religious privileges are but a seed dropped into the sand of the desert. They cannot bear fruit, or indeed do anything for us. We may dare to say that even to Mary, it was more necessary that she should have the fear of God in her heart than that she should be the mother of the incarnate Son, since our Lord himself has told us so. You remember that that striking scene in after years when one in a crowd of eager listeners around him in a transport of enthusiasm essayed to win his heart by references to the blessedness of his mother. Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps that thou hast sucked. What was his answer? He does not disparage, much less deny, the high standing and privilege of his mother Mary, but he insists that both for her and for all others 
the more important thing is that temper of obedient fear, which alone makes great religious privileges other than dangerous. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. He does not here imply that his mother did not satisfy this condition of true blessedness. We are told indeed that she kept in view all God's providential dealings towards her and pondered them in her heart. But he would draw attention away from religious privilege, however eminent, to those vital conditions without which no spiritual advantages can be turned to good account. We can never afford to lose sight of this truth. The human mind is constantly tempted to think that the possession of high religious office or of special religious opportunities is of itself a warrant of, of religious security in time and for eternity. Nothing is less true. A man may be an apostle and yet a Judas. He may be a companion of apostles and yet a Demas. He may be a receiver of that greatest of all the gifts of God, that gift by receiving which we are most nearly likened to Mary, the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, and yet he may eat and drink his own condemnation, not discerning the Lord's body. Warm or excited feelings are often full of illusion, but the important matter is that sensitiveness of conscience to the will and the presence of God, which the Bible calls fear. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. He hath great delight in his commandment. Blessed are all they that fear the Lord and walk in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labours of thine hands. O oh, well is thee, and happy shalt thou be. And thus we are led to reflect even in presence of the highest religious distinction that ever was conferred on a human being, that, after all, religion places all men on a level more truly than any other force or agency in this world. The great inequalities between human lives are due to causes which are rooted in the nature of things and always operative. If these inequalities could be suppressed by legal enactment tomorrow, they would reappear in a week's time. The rich and poor, the powerful and the defenceless, the honoured and the neglected, will ever be found in human society, for the simple reason that men enter life with different equipments of natural power, and this difference will certainly express itself in consequences beyond. Some men who have dwelt constantly and even bitterly on the social and other inequalities of life have endeavoured to console themselves by reflecting that nature and books redress the balance. Whatever be our position in life, they say, we are all equally free to enjoy a writer like Shakespeare. Monarchs and working men are, for the moment, on a level before the genius and insight which instructs and delights us all. Again, whatever be our position in life, we are all equally free to enjoy nature. The outline of the great mountain, the first burst of spring, the glories of the autumnal sunset, the mystery of the heavens on a clear night, the sea with its ever-changing moods of storm and calm, these are common property. Undoubtedly, to a certain extent, this is true. But in order to relish the masterpieces of literature, at least some education is needed. And men who would enjoy nature most thoroughly are not always free enough or wealthy enough to visit her where she may be seen to the best advantage. It is otherwise with those elementary movements of the soul upon which God sheds his mercy, and which are the first steps, as they are the crowning accomplishments of a religious life. Every human heart may fear and love the being who made it. 
religious instruction and religious opportunities are indeed precious. And when they are within reach, fear and love will conspire to make the most of them, since assuredly they cannot be neglected without peril. But when they are not to be had, if there be the fear of God in the heart, there most surely is his mercy too. And where there is the love of the perfect moral being, there also is within reach a presence in the soul which may even compare with that vouchsafed to Mary. If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Only one woman could be the mother of the Most Holy when he vouchsafed to enter our human world. But there is no reason why each and all of us should not know by experience what the Apostle means by that astonishing yet most blessed saying, Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs>